Food pathogens are what you imagine they would be. Microorganisms that we might find on food, either they're on purpose or not, that can impact the human body and cause disease. Well, for the United States, foodborne illness kills approximately 5,200 Americans every year, hospitalizes about 300,000, causes something on the order of 70 million illnesses a year. So it's probably a bigger problem than most people realize. We want to know a number of things as researchers. We want to know how bacterium gets into uh, the food supply system, what it does when it's there, and the impact that it's going to have on human health once it arrives. It's biology in action. Emerging Science is a Vermont Public Television production in partnership with and funded by Vermont NSF EPSCOR. EPSCOR, supporting science and engineering in Vermont colleges and businesses and encouraging young Vermonters to seek careers in science. Hi, I'm Amy Seidel and welcome to Emerging Science. This week our subject is food-borne pathogens. From tainted spinach to recalled hamburgers, even to products such as peanut butter, we've all heard the stories of outbreaks and recalls due to salmonella, E. coli, and other food-borne illnesses. What does it all mean and what are scientists doing to understand, detect and solve these problems? When our basic necessities of food, water or shelter become threatened, we need to understand why. And in the case of foodborne illnesses, the culprit exists by the billions at a microscopic level. Our starting point, bacteria. <laughs> If you counted up the number of cells that we have on the human body, and then you counted up the number of bacterial cells we have on and in the human body, there's 10 times more bacteria. We're an entire ecosystem, a meta-being, and without bacteria we wouldn't be able to digest our food appropriately, we wouldn't be able to produce certain vitamins, and um, our immune system wouldn't function. Of the billions of bacteria that are present in our environment, we only care about those that can live at 37 degrees in a moist environment. Most of them are fine, and we should just leave them alone. <laughs> well, a food pathogen is, is, a, is a microorganism, they're typically bacteria, that have the capacity to infect or to intoxicate humans causing illness. There are all sorts of really interesting pathogens. I think they're interesting because of what they're capable of doing. One tiny thing that's maybe a micron, you know, a one millionth of a meter, um, can impact us so amazingly, kill us even. Uh, the biggest foodborne pathogens are probably salmonella. It's the number one in the United States. It impacts uh, at least one and a half million, those that are reported. Um, and then the next one is Campylobacter, or Campylobacter, as it's generally called. It's very similar to salmonella. It likes to live at 37 degrees which is Celsius, which is our body temperature, and um, it causes gastrointestinal problems, just like salmonella. And then probably the next one after that is listeria. But salmonella and campylobacter probably make up about 80% of the foodborne illnesses that we see, which is about 3 million. E. coli is actually one of the smaller ones, but it can be more lethal than the others. There's a whole range, depending on the type of food and the chemistry of the food that will support that particular type of pathogen. So some foods are more vulnerable to one type of pathogen than another. In recent years, it seems that almost all food types have been susceptible to foodborne illness. So how do these pathogens find their way into our food supply? As Jane Hill describes, one of the most dangerous sources is the age-old combination of livestock and agriculture, our use of animal manure as fertilizer. There are certain sources of pathogens that are probably more dangerous than others, and those are associated with manures. Throughout time, we've used manure as a source of fertilizer for crops, and it still goes on today. Whenever you find a chicken house, you'll usually find that they take the manure and spread it onto croplands as a source of fertilizer. Manure can enter the food system in many ways, both from a fertilizer that's applied to crops, or actually when you're slaughtering an animal. 
the entire animal goes into a slaughterhouse. And so there's plenty of opportunities for that animal's manure, the feces, to get mixed in with, with the food. And that can also happen when someone fails to wash their hands properly after going to the bathroom. Water is transported. Uh, if, you, if you go out to California, you'll find there's a lot of irrigation. So pathogens, one of the ways in which they can get onto the produce is through the irrigation system. We want to know how a bacterium gets into the food supply system, what it does when it's there, and the impact that it's going to have on human health. In my case, we try to understand how bacteria get from one place to another. And what we study, particularly in my lab, is bacteria that are able to turn themselves around in the flow and actually head upstream, perhaps where we don't want them. We tend to use um, very specific devices that allow us to control the physics and the chemistry and therefore the biology of our organism. We use microfluidic devices. We pump fluid through on the order of microliters per minute, so very small flows. We can add up essentially all of the forces acting on the bacterium and then predict where it might be and when it might get there. Many bacteria are able to swim, they're able to propel themselves um, through water, for example. And we try and understand how effectively they do that so we can predict when a bacterium gets into an irrigation pipe, for example, how far it will travel and how to flush it out of the system more effectively. There's a lot of opportunity for pathogens to be introduced when you have a lot of machines that aren't necessarily cleaned terribly well and lots of handling to get the food from one place to another. It's amazing, actually, if you think about it, that we don't get sick more often. Knowing how bacteria get from one place to another can be applied to groundwater systems, the urinary tract, irrigation systems, anywhere where there's flow, and being able to predict that can have an impact on human health. Throughout time, we've had food pathogens impacting uh, humans. Um, in the past few years, it's become easier to monitor and to spread the information once an outbreak has occurred. So it seems like we've had more outbreaks recently than we have in the past. More and more, we're hearing about these big nationwide outbreaks of foodborne illness. There was E. coli in spinach several years ago. There was a big peanut butter outbreak caused by salmonella bacteria. And even more recently, there's been a salmonella outbreak from raw cookie dough. So we're finding more and more different types of food items that can be associated with foodborne illness outbreaks. You know, in the past, we knew about raw eggs or raw poultry can give you salmonella, and ground beef can give you E. coli. But you know, now we're getting into produce and peanut butter and cookie dough outbreaks and things that we might not have anticipated. In 2009, one of the largest salmonella outbreaks in history originated with the Peanut Butter Corporation of America. This has been recognized as one of the nation's worst outbreaks of foodborne illness, with a product recall list close to 4,000 grocery store items. Peanut butter is a product that's eaten all over the world. It's got a long shelf life. And it turns out that there's a big plant in Georgia that makes a lot of peanut butter that goes all over the world. What we think happened in that plant is there was a leak in the roof, so there might have been some water that got in through the leaky roof that might have been contaminated with bird droppings. That could be a source of salmonella. There, I think, were also some rodent problems in that plant, and rodents can transmit salmonella through their feces. So something got in there and contaminated the plant, and then all the peanut butter that was produced went all over the world because of the global food distribution that we have. And there were cases in lots of different countries, um, hundreds of cases. And when something goes wrong in plants that are literally producing millions and millions of pounds of product per day, again, the, the peanut paste example is the best one of contaminated product going into everything, cookies, crackers, cereals, pet food, you name it. It was hard to find product that wasn't affected in that particular outbreak, but the same is true for Frankfurt manufacturer, deli meat manufacturer, um, again, the bagged spinach and lettuce, pot pies. The scale is not necessarily a bad thing, but the problem is that as you get larger and larger, the stakes become ever higher and the system becomes ever more unforgiving.
very large scales of production combined with very complex and long distribution chains, combined with consumers that have an expectation of buying food in bulk often and keeping food in their own refrigerator for an extended period of time. When you go into some of these large-scale food processing plants, the employee turnover is incredible, and the food industry has used a lot of guest workers, people that don't have sufficient levels of education and training. All of our government policies have really fostered the cheap food supply. The mega processing plant and the unforgiving nature of that system and the, the potential risks involved. We arrived at that point because of, of the, the system that we've had in place for a hundred years, um, which is to concentrate production processing and get ever larger. To provide an example of the incredible scale of food production in the United States, we asked Professor Paul Kinstead to describe the industrialized growth of one of Vermont's favorite products, cheese. Our cheese making experience in this country is so different from what had happened in, in Europe and the Mediterranean over, over many, many centuries previous to that time. In Europe, cheese has developed over long periods of time in local settings that were very different environmentally, ecologically, culturally. And these cheeses became part of the local culture, the local identity, part of, of daily life. It was the English who colonized North America, and it was English cheesemakers who brought cheesemaking technology. Basically, that, that for the first almost 300 years of cheesemaking, one cheese, this hard-type English-style hard cheddar, what became known as cheddar-type cheese, really dominated. And the Industrial Revolution is kicking in, and cheesemakers at this point are still making cheese on the farm, as they've always done and they're producing maybe 20,000 pounds of cheese on a farm with 30 or 40 cows. 1851, the first cheese factory comes into play. The first year, that first factory produces 100,000 pounds of cheese, five times what's being made on a large farm. Cheese factories begin to spring up all over the Northeast and Upper Midwest where cheese is being made at that point, all the way out to Wisconsin, which just recently, at this point, had begun making cheese. Farmstead cheese making begins to die away. Factory cheese making on the rise. Suddenly, late 1870s, oversupply, overproduction. The price of cheese plummets, and it becomes a crisis. A cycle begins to be set up that would haunt or characterize, depending on your perspective, the cheese industry for the next 100 years or more, right up to the present. By the middle of the 20th century, after World War II, in the 1950s into the early 60s, Cheese plants are, have reached the point where instead of producing 100,000 pounds of cheese in a year, like that first cheese factory, they're producing 100,000 pounds of cheese a day. And by the end of the 20th century and, and up into the present, big cheese operations now are producing not 100,000 pounds of cheese a day, but a million pounds, of a million pounds of cheese a day. A million pounds of cheese a day from 10 million pounds of milk. Um, you know, fantastic scales of production.